Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, our DAS uh, Zoom Memorial for Paul Pablo Williams. Um, we were all really shocked and surprised to hear about Paul. Um, and uh, I want to remind you that um, there's another memorial that was recorded on um, April 24th out at the Taos Country Club that you can link to on the TAS website. Or now we have an official TAS YouTube channel. So you can even go into YouTube at um, Taos Archaeological Society and we'll have this video posted there as well as soon as we finish it today. So welcome everyone. Um, we're just going to go through some information and then we'll have uh, the participants, um, if they want to say anything after that, um, to talk and um, tell, tell any kind of story they want to tell <laughs> about Paul. So um, anyway, Paul, Paul passed away April 10th, 2021 at his home in Albuquerque. He was born in, on May 24th, 1949. So he was um, um, 72. He would have been um, 72, May 24th. Um, and Paul was a native of Longmont, Colorado. And um, he had a lot of friends there and he, he apparently was one of the ringleaders of that gang. <laughs> and uh, he um, was on a football team and he was the um, tight end for the football team. And as his family likes to say, uh, Paul cast a long shadow. <laughs> on uh, wherever he went, he cast a long shadow. But um, he, he did his undergraduate degree um, and um, at the University of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee. I'm probably not saying that right. <laughs> but um, he then uh, came back to Longmont and met his wife, Judy. And um, they traveled a lot together. And um, he ended up uh, working at uh, Mesa Verde National Park and participating and then just pursuing his graduate degree at the University of Colorado. Um, and then they moved to Glenwood Springs and um, they had both their children there at Glenwood Springs, um, Benjamin and Sarah, and um, then also later um, came Andrew. But um, they, um, at that time, um, around 1984, pa Pablo came to work for the BLM in Taos until his retirement in 2012. And about then is when we all came to know him. And um, the people who were in Taos then, I myself, I didn't get to Taos till 1995, but um, he, um, in 1987, they were on a raft trip, he and Christine Ponko and some others. And they um, start talking about forming the Taos Archaeological Society. So in 1987, the Taos Archaeological Society was formed and right away, um, they started an excavation at a site called the Yano Quemado Rim Project on, um, the, on private land here in Taos. And um, at that time, um, they started to get interest in local um, members and the group. And the group started to grow from there from 1987. So Pablo was a traveler and he liked draft trips and he loved to travel and he loved um, bird, he loved bird watching and sporting events and, and um, 
if you watch the the video that his family put together at the Taos Country Club, you'll see that he traveled all over to see chess matches and different baseball games and different sporting events of his children. So that was really important to him. But uh, he ended up um, retiring in 2012 from BLM here in Taos and moved to Albuquerque. So um, he would be um, there with his family and his grandkids uh, as they watched them grew up grow up because that was that was uh, of course the most important thing to him. But um, we have um, also a little um, PowerPoint here to show you that we put together just from photographs that some of you have seen and and probably some of you haven't seen. So we'll we'll go through the, the PowerPoint here real quickly and um, welcome everyone to the ceremony. Um, and anyway, my name's Phil Aldrich, for those of you that don't know me. Um, some of you and your family might watch this later, but uh, and Pablo's family. But I'm the current president of uh, Taos Archaeological Society. So we want to acknowledge that uh, we're presenting from the Taos area and that the Taos Pueblo and the ancestral Puebloan peoples here of Picaris and Pot Creek and all of the sites from the Valdez phase around a thousand years ago and all the hunters and gatherers before that <laughs> from 7,000 years ago. We want to acknowledge that we live on their land and we are coexisting um, and with a sensitivity to the culture and to the people of um, the ancestral um, lands of the entire hemisphere of the indigenous people. So Pablo, um, um, as I mentioned, was um, came in 1984 to Taos and he worked for the Bureau of Land Management there. And he began his career um, by immediately, um, almost, starting the Tallis Archaeological Society, which is a really important link to um, everything that's happened ever since then <laughs> with the Tallis Archaeological Society. We've tried to sustain projects with the Carson National Forest, and, and he was really the beginning of that. And um, it, it's uh, important to acknowledge that it takes a certain kind of person to um, uh, accept that responsibility, to understand um, the commitment of the BLM and the federal offices to outreach educational programs and um, archeological information um, to the people in the community but also, also to the schools and to the education of um, the children. Um, most importantly, um, we, we've all seen how petroglyphs have been defaced in the area and graffitied in the area. And he understood really well that you have to start early and you have to go into the schools and to make people understand the um, cultural resource heritage and the importance of protecting preservation and conservation of archaeological sites. And Pablo liked the river. He liked to get on the river and he loved to do raft trips and many, many times um, he went with groups down into the Chama and on the Rio Grande here. And um, he was an outdoorsy person to say the least. 
as uh, most of us archaeologists are, um, we go crazy when we spend too much in time inside. And so we, we don't do that very often. But he, he was always um, an instigator of group trips. And I mean, there couldn't be a better um, people person than Pablo to organize trips and organize people. In fact, Pablo uh, would say, you know, I'm, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> and immediately a group of people would form around him and, and him, his ideas to, um, to make it happen. And um, that's what it takes. So that's leadership um, from a, um, from an um, organizational point of view, but also from a um, personality point of view. So very early on, um, there was an excavation that began, um, as I mentioned, at the Ano Queimado Rim Project. Annette Grubas was really kind of the field director there, along with Pablo and, and the early part of the Toss Archaeological Society. Um, 1988, 1989, soon after the formation of the group. And this whole video is actually online too at taosarch.org at the Toss Archaeological Society website. You can watch this very early um, video uh, recording of the excavations um, that are, are, have been transferred from VHS to, to that digital format. And also I would direct you to that too for more Tals archeological history. Under TAS about us, you can drop down to uh, TAS history and really in three main parts there, you can read the entire history of the Tals archeological society. But Pablo won a lot of awards. Pablo had, um, had an, an, um, made a couple of visits to um, the White House <laughs> for uh, community service awards that he won. And um, a lot of it had to do with the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project where he organized youth groups to be out there um, recording petroglyphs and doing um, internships to learn about the petroglyphs. Again, going back to that idea about um, training um, children and, and young people in schools about preservation and conservation, which is um, a huge project. But probably the most important thing you can do is to make sure the next generation understands why we need um, preservation and conservation laws to protect archaeological sites and cultural resources. So um, Pablo, again, he, he was an outdoor person and he he, after he retired, he continued to visit with us up here at our potlucks in the summer and in the winter he would show up and um, grace us with his presence <laughs> and his laugh and his stories and it was always great to see Pablo when he was here. So um, this is a shot from uh, Belize where um, on a trip that we took down, the last trip I took with them that started at the Belize City Airport. Um, here's uh, Joy and Frank Purcell and David and Carol Farmer and, and um, Jenny Clinton. So you probably um, recognize most of those people. But Pablo liked to visit sites and, and BLM was a great job for him to be able to go out and, um, and visit sites uh, continuously um, and be outside and coordinate with all the site watch uh, volunteers to, to visit sites regularly and, um, 
and make sure that um, they were being protected and that conservation um, methods were in place and occasionally um, go out and do rescue projects on sites that had been uh, damaged, um, salvage projects for the BLM. But he liked being out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I would say that something I knew about Pablo. I, I met him the first time in 1995 and and uh, he, he again, yeah, was casting a long shadow, <laughs> but uh, uh, it was great. Um, the, in five minutes, he's a kind of person um, that you would say, yeah, I need to get to know this, this person better because he was always, of course, soft-spoken and mild-mannered, and he had a great laugh that um, always brought people together. And that's what he liked to do. He liked to be with people doing projects and engaging people in archeology span and, and always talking about archeology span and he, he had all the historical experience and background about anything he could talk about, really. Um, and he got people um, engaged in archaeology that way. And uh, Taos is a place where people have come from all over the place, many, many different places. And actually now, as the baby boomers are retiring, more and more and more people are coming to Taos. Um, many from California, I predict, <laughs> will be coming this way. And uh, so it, it's been a place where what they started in 1987 um, was bound to get bigger and better. And, and it just needed to be pushed along, really. And uh, we, we have about 135 um, active members now, and it's the biggest archeological society um, besides Albuquerque in, in the state by far. This is his wife, Judy, and um, she um, was up here um, for the ceremony at the Taos Country Club and she's doing fine and she's hanging in there. Um, she um, traveled a lot with Paul and they spent a lot of time traveling to different places um, all over uh, the hemisphere. And Pablo liked to do uh, petroglyph talks and talk about petroglyphs and talk about, um, talk about um, protection of petroglyphs and, and preservation and conservation of petroglyphs and and he took a lot of groups all over the place um, to Three Rivers, to um, different sites up in Utah and all over uh, New Mexico, of course. So again, Pablo was the kind of person who, <laughs> who whenever there was somebody going somewhere or he got an idea to take a trip, he would just start talking about it and, and many, many, many people would, would be interested in following along. And a lot of times those, those sites were in Mexico and Guatemala and other places in Latin America uh, because he, he loved bird watching and that's where a lot of the birds are, part one. But part two, um, he loved being an archaeological site, so um, it's hard to explain kind of archaeologists where, you know, just visiting a site isn't necessarily enough. It's like we have to live in the site <laughs> for months and months and months because you have that same kind of um, really connection or spiritual feeling with the site um, and you have it every day. Um, when you're working in archaeological sites. And I think it's a connection that, that all of us have who have worked over the years um, in sites together. And um, it's, um, it's a great feeling. And Pablo definitely had a connection to the sites in, in Latin America. 
And he liked being out in the field, recording with people and and um, and teaching them how to record archaeological sites and teaching them how to properly record petroglyphs and and work on um, work on sites um, and learn uh, the scientific method that um, we all use to properly uh, record archaeological sites. And he he always got a kick out of that watching people learn. So he was a great teacher. And um, we, we spent a lot of time um, climbing archaeological sites, going to different places and and Pablo would, would always be the one to like, um, yeah, we're, we're gonna climb up there. <laughs> Not just some of us, like all of us, we're all going up there. And he was uh, always the one to be watching out for people's safety and to make sure everyone had fun on trips. And as I mentioned, he, he would come up for our potlucks and he would, um, this is his little um, side eye glance that he had. <laughs> and many of you would recognize this <laughs> uh, from different times and places. But uh, he, he um, again, he always took the time to come up and visit Taos after he retired in, in 2012. And um, I took a couple of different trips with him. Uh, we guided uh, into Latin America. This is in um, Belize here, this site. And um, we had 22 members of the Toss Archaeological Society. And in 2001, we had two vans full that um, came into Belize and traveled into Guatemala to visit the sites there. And so here we are. Um, this is the last trip again. Sorry, I doubled the slide, but we landed in Belize together. Um, this small group on the last trip I took with them. Um, and again, we, we drove into Guatemala and um, into this area of Guatemala that's south of Tikal, actually. And uh, Pablo. Um, was always the one when we were looking at maps. It's like, well, here, here's where I think we're going to go, Pablo. And he goes, well, what about this place? And what about that place? And why can't we go there? <laughs> and he was always the one to drive the itinerary further and deeper into the jungle um, where there could be um, um, narco traffickers and Guatemalan SWAT teams and um, down roads like Pablo, I'm not sure what's gonna happen down this road. And, and uh, it didn't seem to bother him. He was, <laughs> he was always cool and calm and collected and gave the group confidence to, to plow ahead. So the last trip we, we ended up in this place called Sayasche in Guatemala, about two hours south on the road south of uh, all on the river. This is the Pasión River here in Sayasche and all the boat traffic. Um, same way the Maya would have used this river with all their canoes. But here's our, our boat. Our boat was a speed boat with that big motor on it, a little bit faster than those other boats, <laughs> than the cargo boats. Um, but we um, were traveling down the river, the Rio Patesh Batun on this trip. And uh, Pablo was pretty much in heaven. He just had a big smile on his face all the time <laughs> uh, because there were so many birds and crocodiles in the river. And just, um, you know, when he was in these places, he was just um, loving it. And that's, that's what, uh, what you wanna see when you're traveling with people in strange places. He was always confident and uh, calm. And we were traveling to this island here, uh, the peninsula that goes out into the Lake 
the test button here. Um, and um, on this um, I Peninsula is a hotel where we were staying. And uh, this hotel, this peninsula actually is a pre-classic Maya site. And you can visit the, the uh, ancestral um, home. We don't call them ruins anymore. They're called ancestral homes <laughs> of the pre-classic Maya on this peninsula. And, um, and there's still a lot there to see. Um, but this, uh, this, this peninsula, this was um, Pablo's hut here. I was Pablo's roommate for the, the week here. And this was kind of our base camp where we hung out on the porch. And um, he, again, just big smile on his face all the time. <laughs> when he was in the, the most remote places I can think of. Um, on this trip, we visited um, Cebal um, and Aguateca, um, another site close by this peninsula. And we were on the river all day um, for the five days um, and just bird watching and, and visiting sites. And also Dos Pilas, this is the stairway, hieroglyphic stairway of Dos Pilas. And we finished that trip at um, Caracol in um, Belize. This is Cana, the sky palace of Caracol, the twin pyramid complex, um, classic Maya site, Caracol. And Pablo, um, in these sites, he was he was just happy sitting there <laughs> and enjoying and, and soaking it all in and absorbing history that had taken place there. And you could see that he was just um, really in his element when we were visiting sites and um, always wanting to talk about uh, the next trip, even before we finished the trip that we were on. <laughs> and Pablo um, knew about the history of the Maya. And, and when you were standing in the doorways of these chambers on top of pyramids or in sacred places, he, he understood that these were special places. Um, that only the kings and queens and priests would have been standing. And he knew that um, um, these were special um, surroundings to be in these archeological sites. Anytime, if it's Chaco Canyon or, or Yaxchilan in Mexico. So Pablo um, was drawn from Longmont, Colorado to, to Taos, um, like the rest of us, came from somewhere else, almost all of us. And um, Taos, um, for me, um, was a sacred place before people were here. And the part of the reason why is um, Taos embodies really the three-part world of the worldview of the Maya and many, many indigenous people because we have the gorge, which is like um, symbolic of the underworld. We have the large plateau where everyone lives in the present and the highest mountains in New Mexico, which are really symbolic of the upper world. So for, for whatever reason, people get attracted to Taos. Um, it could be subliminal, but I would suggest to you that it's probably inside of all of us that are here, uh, the ones that come and stay, that we have some kind of um, unconscious um, knowledge, collective unconscious, to be Jungian about it, I guess you could say. <laughs> about this uh, connection to this uh, three-part world that all indigenous people have. And it explains why Taos Pueblo has been occupied for so long. 
and has been um, a World Heritage Site, the most visited world, cultural World Heritage Site in, um, ever recorded. And uh, it continues to, to be that way. So the mountains um, also have this underlying um, idea of sustainability that, that during the long droughts in the Southwest, that Taos the, was always going to have water because if any if it snowed anywhere it was going to be on Mount Wheeler and the mountains that we have here um, that that would make um, this this area sustainable when other places like Chaco Canyon um, had to be abandoned because of lack of water. So Pablo. Um, <laughs> assuming the position here after a long hike, um, love to be um, as far away um, as it took to get to the next archaeological so site. And he loved his van, driving his van around and, and camping in his van and, um, and just being outside and, and being with other groups of people. Um, this is the um, last known photograph that, that I have uh, access to. Um, Gary Grief took this photograph at Chiflo when they were out there recording um, petroglyphs. Um, I think not too long ago, probably, I'm not sure exactly, but several years ago. And that's all we have there. Um, I guess I didn't mute, so I guess I would say a few things, Phil, if that's okay. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, I joined Taos, Arche this is Jane, I joined the Taos Archaeological Society in 2007 in order to go on the trip to Arizona. And at that time, that's when I met Paul. And I was thinking back, uh, I have been on eight trips with Paul, starting in 2009, going to Utah. I met him actually on the Baja trip in 2009, which was fantastic. And Cher Churchill and I attended one of the Pecos conferences with him, which is where I really got to spend time with him, uh, hearing some of his stories. and. Uh, and then he was always, and we kind of sort of planned a couple of trips together. We kind of co-wrangled, but he was always great on every trip just for being a unifying personality and really fun to be around and just a, a lovely spirit. Uh, when Nora and I were site stewards at uh, POSI at Ojo Caliente, he came out several times to look at things, confirm things. I tend to find things and I find a lot of false positives. And so Paul was able to, you know, actually verify some of those. Um, I actually talked to him just two or three months ago. I called ahead if someone else wanted to get information and he sounded great. And like life was, he said life was going so well for him. And I'm really glad that I had that time, you know, to talk to him. Um, but he was so much fun to be around and he and David Bebouts were together, a lot of fun. So uh, I, I can't imagine how his family is experiencing such a sudden loss, but um, yeah, it was a it was a real privilege to to be around him. End of story. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, I think we all um, came off um, from meeting Paul with um, <clears throat> with a calmer attitude, I and mean, he he kind of <laughs> lowered everybody's blood pressure just uh -huh. by having him around. <laughs> I think. Yeah. And uh, that was always a good um, experience for, um, for um, everyone. 
when he was participating. Mm -hmm. um, but um, any anyone else have any comments or experiences with Pablo? <laughs> Pablo? Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I I uh, I had heard his name. Um, I, you know, he's he's the first um, like public archaeologist that I ever knew and worked with. Uh, you know, I have experience in archaeology, but it was all CRM stuff. So everybody that I knew either you know was academic and working in the field, or um, uh, you know, or just just shovel bums and whatnot. Um, and I'd never really worked with somebody who was employed by the government and, um, you know, a, a, had public responsibilities. And I got to say, you know, him, uh, him being the first of that that I ever met uh, has made it real hard in comparison with all the others I've met, sadly, uh, because he was such a people person. And, and he was so into outreach and kids and, and um yeah, it's just kind of frustrating dealing with uh, with other, you know, BLM, Forest Service people. Not all of them, certainly, but, well, although, you know, even the best of them are not like him in, in terms of, like, that outreach, especially with schools and stuff. That's how I met him was when my daughter was in fifth grade uh, here in Ojo Caliente, Mesa Vista Schools, uh, Rivers and Birds program uh, decided that, you know, here they're hauling their kids over to Hupobi over here every year as part of their, their course. Uh, they said, well, you know, there's that school right there across the valley from Hupobi. And, um, and, and technically, it's actually in Rio Arriba County, but we should do our program over there. And, it, and they do that fifth grade program. And it happened to be the year my daughter was in fifth grade. And so uh, they were looking for parents to come on the field trips. And so I think I probably started with that Hupobi one, which was early in the season and ended up going on pretty much all their field trips, which was great. It was a great program. And, and I met Paul uh, going, when going up to Hupobi. And, and uh, I don't know if you saw, I sent somebody that picture I have of him there doing his classic Sermon on the Mount pose. Um, addressing a bunch of school kids and stuff in the grid gardens up above Hupobi around where, where cotton pollen had been found in the grid gardens. Everyone's great surprise uh, this far north and high up and everything. Uh, but, but he would come, I, you know, as you know, I, I roam around a lot and find stuff. And most of, most of it are over here is, is Carson Forrest, um, who are all very nice and interested. But as far as going out in the field, you know, they all say, yeah, I'd love to do that, but, you know, I don't have time, maybe next year, uh, you know, whatever. And, but Paul, I, a couple of things that I found on BLM, one was a, a curious sort of quarry site. Um, and he said, well, yeah, when can you go out there? And, and he brought Carmen over. That's the first time I met her. And we went out and looked at this, at this quarry. It was um, what's locally known as Ojo Opal. It's, you know, some kind of, um, of mineral uh, thermal deposit, I guess, in cracks in the sandstone. Um, but then the, uh, the other one that was great was the Greenman site. This local guy had told me about a site that was up the Big Arroyo, and he's a guy who doesn't um, use maps. Uh, he's been everywhere here, I think, while taking various substances, so sometimes the directions are difficult to interpret. But in this case, he said, yeah, uh, it's it's up that you know you go up that big arroyo there, and I said, well, arroyo rico, you mean? Is that what it's called? Yeah, I don't know, but low income housing there, you know. Yeah, that's the one. And and then you know you go up there, and there's a uh, a slot canyon up in there. Like, yeah, I actually surprisingly enough, I do know where that is. I found that one time. Um, it has it has uh, cottonwood trees, and and so I said, hey, there's water over there. Let's check it out. And he said, well, you know, there's that rock which looks like a, an old Indian in profile, that, that cliff. And I'm like, I noticed that from one angle, it kind of does, yeah. Well, you go up to the left there to the ridge and you go out to the left and you get out there and there's, there's a site out there. And he said, I'm sure there's structure, you don't see it, but there's a lot of pottery and stuff. And, and so I told Paul and Paul's like, yeah, let's check this out. So uh, with my young son, we went up there 
and <laughs> I was very pleased because we got up to the ridge and, and you can either go left out onto this sort of island of rock out there or follow it right up onto the main, um, the main mesa. And Paul goes, well, which way did he say? And I said, it's, it's to the, he said, go left out onto this thing. And he said, nah, that can't be right. That makes no sense. It's got to be to the right up on that ridge on the edge of the mesa. And I, and I said, well, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, I'm just following his directions. He said, no, nah, that, that makes no sense. Uh, I want to go to the right here. And I said, go ahead. I, I'm going to follow the directions. And, and I went out and looked around and started seeing uh, uh, pot shirts and flakes and stuff and, you know, yelled back at him, hey, it's over here. <laughs> but but uh, I was pretty pleased with that. But I was, uh, I was surprised he was, he was, he was firm that that just made no sense. And it is, it's, you know, of course, a spectacularly sighted uh, little ruin, and uh, it's still not documented. Paul, I, the only other picture I have of Paul is him sitting in the middle of that writing notes, um, but it still, it never did get actually recorded, surprisingly enough, uh, someday, perhaps. Uh, but, but Paul was just, just so great at, at being responsive, and, and I think, like you were saying, working with kids is, is just, boy, nobody's doing that. And it, it just, it's got to make so much difference in the long run. Um, yeah, geez, what a great guy. And I'm thinking, geez, he's only five years older than me. Too. But so anyway, I miss him and I wish I'd seen more. I, I now I'm thinking I should have come to those potlucks over there because I haven't seen Paul in years. I've exchanged some emails, but haven't seen him in many years. Yeah, well, um, carpe diem and all that, <laughs> especially from the COVID from last year, we're all kind of in the cloud and all of us um, lost a little bit of something last year <laughs> for sure and some more than others. So, um, but yeah, I'm happy to report we have a new BLM archeologist um, Natalie Sanford, who is very interested in working with the Taos Archaeological Society. And we have a new um, project coming up that probably will be a multi-year project um, covering um, a survey out here near um, the gorge uh, of a large lithic scatter. Um, 500,000 artifacts, so if you like lithic artifacts. Um, you might be um, interested for TAS members in joining that survey. You should contact me <laughs> for that, uh, Tim. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that it'll be an ongoing thing, I think. Uh, we'll do two weekends in 2021, two weekends in 2022, and so on until we get the site recorded, but uh, I do think we have a kindred spirit in this Natalie Sanford to Paul, somebody who really wants to engage us. And um, so we will engage her <laughs> as much as we want and um, continue along those lines. But um, yeah, well, um, I guess we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, and um, thank you all for coming. And I hope everybody gets to watch this. As I mentioned, uh, we'll, we'll post this on the TAS website at talsarc.org and also on our new YouTube channel. Uh, you'll be able to see that. At, um, just go to YouTube under Tals Archaeological Society and we're going to start posting our videos there, our video lectures. So um, everybody, um, yeah, I'm glad you could join us and, and we all miss Paul already, um, of course. And, uh, and he did set a high bar, I must say. <laughs> and uh, as I think everyone who ever met him um, came away a better person and, and recognized um, what he was contributing to the archaeology and the and the Taos Valley 
and and places beyond. <laughs> so, but thanks everybody for joining us, and um, we will see you soon at, at other meetings, um, our monthly meetings um, for the Tulsa Archaeological Society. So.